Hello and welcome back to the Play It Forward podcast presented by Peace Players, the podcast where we lift up the voices and stories of people working in their communities and networks to promote peace and equity. I am your host, Chitty Nwagbo, and I am so thrilled about our show today because uh, the person that we're interviewing today or even just speaking with, right, having a comfortable, wonderful conversation with is mm-hmm. going to probably be my mentor. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm just <laughs> mm-hmm. shining that wonderful. No, um, she's absolutely brilliant. And the work she does, I'm so excited to just dive deep into just everything you do, the people you're impacting. So that being said, on today's episode, we will speak to our very special guest about social responsibility and the importance of sports in the service of humanity. Uh, But before we do that, let me introduce the most handsome, the most amazing co-host ever, Emmett Shepard. Oh my God, guys, stop clapping, guys, stop, stop. It's just me. It's just me. (laughs) Um, Hello and hello. I am Emmett Shepard, the lanky and goofy co-host to the beautifully intelligent and soulful human being of Chini Nuagbo. Oh, thank you. And Chini... I, I think you said it best. This is somebody who I haven't even spoken more than five words to. And I'm already like, can you help me with financial advice for my future? <laughs> <laughs> um, help me she, build her, a new world. <laughs> everything about her. I can just tell the vibe. I, I'm so excited for our conversation today. Tell the people who we're talking to. She is a dynamic, visionary, philanthropic impact strategist who over the past two decades has galvanized community engagement with internationally recognized brands, including the Golden State Warriors, San Francisco 49ers, Service Now, City of Mountain View, and Special Olympics. I love that Special Olympics part. Mm -hmm. Uh, As Mm -hmm. the president and chief impact officer of Olive Plus Rose, she works with professional athletes, legends, entertainers, philanthropists, well Phil- philanthropist. I always say this wrong. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, we got it. Philanthropist, corporate executives, <laughs> high net worth individuals to amplify their impact to inspire change around their areas of passion, commitment, and expertise. She is also the executive director of the Golden Heart Fund, serving 49ers alumni who are in need of financial, medical, um, and emotional support, and spent 12 seasons leading philanthropic efforts for professional sports franchises in the NBA, NFL, and most recently as the Vice President of Community Relations for the Golden State Warriors and the Executive Director of the Warriors Community Foundation. Most importantly, she is a professor at Georgetown and sits on the board of the directors for the Special Olympics. Listeners, if you are not impressed by now, if you're not impressed by now, I don't know what to tell you, but please help me welcome Joanne Pasternak. Mm. Welcome to the show. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, it's wow. so excited to be here. I'm a huge fan of Peace Players, have been for years. And um, yeah, and just honored to be able to be a part of this conversation and to share a little bit about the magical projects that I've been working on and um, the people behind them. So let's get going. Let's fun. get yeah. going. What we usually do before we start any episode with anybody is, uh, I don't know if you've heard this, through the plethora of things that you're a I'm, part I'm of. Sure she but uh, she, okay. if, if you're a human being on planet Earth, you've probably heard of this. But yeah. I am known uh, as the Icebreaker King. Yeah, and Ooh, so, I love icebreakers. Um, <laughs> perfect. So we already, I don't even need to give you the spiel about what it is. So I'm just going to dive in on today's <laughs> icebreaker. So um, visualize a billboard. You have access mm-hmm. to a billboard that millions of people see every day on their commute to work, walk and sitting on a bench, whatever. Um, what's your billboard say? Ooh, come on. Make a difference. Mm-hmm. It's just oh, I simple love it. as that. Mm-hmm. Make a difference. Simple as that. I want it to be clean. I want it to be direct. And I just want people to think about what it is they could do every day to make a difference. That's right. Um, and it doesn't have to be gigantic. I mean, the billboard can be gigantic because it's. Yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's, so when you that's say, right. when, <laughs> when you say clean, are we thinking Times mm-hmm. New Roman font with like just a white background, mm-hmm. black font? Or what, what's the aesthetic? I mean, I'm partial towards Cubano front, font or, you yeah, know, yeah, some yeah. of those yeah. really like, and, and I'll tell you, there's mm. actually a reason why. I love, <laughs> you've asked this question, Emmett. You did not expect this answer, but I love <laughs> Cubano <laughs> font because it reminds me of protest posters. And it feels like it's like this way of like, who are you? What are you emoting at that moment? Um, I wear wear a bracelet, actually, I'm wearing it right now, that my my dad passed away earlier this year. And I I have this 
have this bracelet that is engraved with his handwriting Mm -hmm. and it's reminding me, it's a note he wrote to me and it's Mm -hmm. reminding me that I I do have the power and the the opportunity to make a difference. And and the fact that it's his handwriting, like that's what does me in every time because I can feel it. I can see it. I can. And I think I've been using this font on my bullet, my, my billboard, having something that's authentically expressing somebody's emotions in the moment yeah. is yeah. crucial too. So totally. that's you real. don't just read it. That you feel was, it. Yeah. That, that's a, yeah. There's my answer. Right. I guess. Um, don't get us crying on this. Like <laughs> yeah, what, what are you trying to oh do? God. Like, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Well, first of oh all, very sorry that your dad passed away. I yeah. Know that you made a he was, yeah, he was an amazing yeah. man, but he guides so much of who I am and what I do. Um, yeah. He had younger onset Alzheimer's. He was diagnosed yeah. at 63. And, um, and his voice was one that was interrupted before he had an opportunity to do all the things he was meant to be. So I actually look at it now as what is it that, that I can put out there into the world and how can I inspire others to just stand up and do what they want to do and do it right now? Because you just, it sounds cliche to say, you don't know how much time you have, but in truth, he even did know because he had a diagnosis that was going to be a long drawn out illness. And even then it's impossible to get it all in. Right. And, yeah. um, and sorry, so, you know, in some ways late. you pass the torch, <laughs> you know, you pass the yeah. torch and off you go, yeah. run with it, do something with it. And, and, yeah. and there, there's, there's so much motivation there, right? There's so much motivation mm-hmm. to live your life fully, authentically and in the moment and yeah. serve something greater than yourself. I love that. I love, mm-hmm. I love that you're even being vulnerable enough to share that with us. Like that's, I know like two minutes in, I'm like, here we are, but um, <laughs> no, this no, is no, my thing. It's I very love good. That. Yes. Yes. Uh, the, I mean, he, he, uh, he blessed me and cursed me with his hair, with his eye color, beautiful. And with a lot of his drive. So <laughs> he's beautiful. not wearing his long, however, for those who it are watching and just listening, but, um, red curly hair on my, my dad left-handed like me. And he used to say, you know, we're one of the kind, except for you and me and my sister and my brother. I mean, like, it was just this thing, this connection that you feel. Yeah. But one of the things that I learned from that was that you can connect with anybody as long as you take the time to figure out what you have in common and Absolutely. What, what brings you together. So mm. it could be that we start off that you and I are like, we're all curly haired people here, right? So let's go with the, you know, we could have the five minute conversation on hair products, Ooh. but it's going to connect us in some way. Yeah. yeah. What do you God. do next? With that? Man. Joanne, we haven't I even, am... I, I like... <laughs> Like, do we even need to keep going at this I point? Mean, like, it, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Just, I so, love the, I want to say really quickly, you said, you know, it's a cliche, but I just love, someone told me this quote, it was just like, cliches are rooted in truth. And I think it's right. so, that's what makes them cliches. So like, right. um, I just want to say, yeah. yeah, cliche on, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. Wow. Why did cliches get a bad rep? I'll never know. I but know. I don't know. Um, I try to avoid them usually. My grandmother used true. to say, if, if you're using certain language that she was not a fan of cursing because she said it just shows your lack of creativity and that you have an incomplete vocabulary. So be mm. more creative than that. But what if you could be yeah. creative cursing? What if that, what if you met the middle ground? Of that's, like- the, that's the approach I take. Yeah. I oh, try okay. to be alliterative. <laughs> you know, you have to be alliterative. Like, right. take, and I, and I like to mix it up by taking the pH sound. Right. Like philanthropy. Right. 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 Yeah. right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Never um, said yeah. that before, but that sounds about No, right, that's so. perfect. That's exactly yeah, perfect. the motto yeah, yeah, I live yeah, yeah. by. Um, Joanne, so you've had a pretty, uh, it's an understatement to say you've had a pretty extensive and impressive career so far. And I, I personally, bef- before, you know, I let our listeners know sort of your story. We'll dive into that and sort of go through your whole journey. Um, I, I think, and me personally, I'm just curious when people ask you what you do, you know, what do you say to them? Because also I feel like your title, so to speak, or your field, it's not just one field. You're pulling from multiple mm-hmm. different fields and sort of when you heal philanthropic, did I say that right? Yeah, you did. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Philanthropic Sorry, impact yeah. strategist. Well, what does that mean? Like, what is it? What is that? Yeah, I, I often re- reference back to this theory that I take to heart, which is what makes you, you. Right. And what is unique about you that can enable you to lean into and be your best self, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, the theory is called Ikigai, which is a Japanese concept. And it's looking at what are you best at? 
um, what does the world need? What do you love? And what can you get paid to do? And it's a really realistic approach. It's saying like, I can't be good at everything. I shouldn't be good at everything. And there are lots of people who can augment whatever I'm not best at. Right. But mm -hmm. if from a philanthropic perspective, from a charitable perspective, I can lean in and figure out that one cause that means the most to me, that I know the most about, or that I can learn the most about, and the world needs somebody to speak up and speak out about it. And by yeah. the way, people will underwrite any type of event or program or awareness campaign around that. Well, that's where you're finding your sweet spot. So my, my, my role is to walk people through that journey to help them find what makes them them mm -hmm. and then to develop their impact on the world based off of that. But I also see it as a bridge. It's a bridge for athletes who saw themselves as being only truly exceptional at one thing, perhaps, right, right. because they spent their earliest years developing a skill. And sports are one of the only places where with age and experience, you get worse and less desirable and less valuable. Mm -hmm. And so right. you think about it, any other job you do, people are like, oh, she's very experienced. He's... Um, He's been competing for, you know, he's been doing this for years in sports, your value goes down as you right, age right, right. and gain experience. And so I look at this as also an opportunity to create a bridge. So if you can figure out who you are philanthropically and where your voice is most valuable, then can't you also start to build that bridge that helps you figure out what the next 20, 40, 60, 80 years of your life looks like. Look like? Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that. That's so uh, true. Because it speaks directly to me, uh, having yeah. been a professional athlete. But what it also does is it allows you to separate your identity from the sport, right? Yeah. You are yeah. not the sport. You're more than mm -hmm. that. So let's figure out what that is. What makes you, you. you what makes you, you. And, and how you, yeah. Go ahead, well, it's please. interesting because there was an article. So Ernst & Young did a study a couple of years ago and, and um, Forbes magazine wrote an article on this piece that was talking about women in leadership and specifically women in the C-suite, CEOs, CFOs, there are not enough of us, we know this, right. but for the women in C-suite, I think it was something like almost 80% had played sports in their youth and not yes. just like showed up at a soccer field and did cartwheels, like, you know, some of the girls did when I was little, <laughs> but, but the ones who showed up and kept <laughs> There's showing There's nothing up. wrong with that. There's nothing and, wrong with that. No, you, but you know these, you know the girls yeah, I'm speaking yeah, of. Um, yeah. but, but here's the thing is the way, the way the article was written, it was acting as though sports made us into leaders. And I take oh. huge issue with that. I actually look at it very differently. From the day I was born, I was oriented a certain way. Mm. And sports was the one place where I could lean in and do that and oh. be me. What made like me, that. me. Mm -hmm. um, and so... If we empower girls through sports and then we continue to empower them and give them the, the confidence they need to rise up, when they go into the boardroom one day, they have that innate ability that's been honed over the years to step right. in and say, I have a voice and I want to be heard. Right. And so that, that's really how I look at it. It's, um, it's you have value beyond the sport because there's something that made you exceptional at your sport. Mm -hmm. There are lots of great athletes out there. I mean, I just said this to my 11 year old the other day. I, I get it. You're the best on the field, but you can be the best. But if you're not working hard, people are going to pass you. You can be the best. But if you talk smack when you're 11 on the field, like that might right. get you in some trouble and you won't right. be seen as coachable. So now right. what? So mm -hmm. it's, it's pulling it together in a way that says, let me lean into what your truest leadership skills are and what you do better than anybody. And in his case, he's just, he's just an energizing, uplifting, redheaded, freckle-faced, speedy guy. And if he walks on the field and he uses his powers for right. good, he's for good, elevating yeah. his whole team. Right. And yeah. so right. 10, 20 years from now, when he's trying to figure out what's next in his life, and he's 11 right now, so let's put him at 31. I, I would love to be able to reflect back and say, you know, hey, Reed, remember when you were quarterbacking for that football team and you had to make that crucial decision, last play of the game, and you handed off, you had somebody give you a handoff, and then guess what? You ran into the end zone and you guys won. Mm -hmm. Like That was a big moment. But right. what was it? You had to put aside your ego as the quarterback to step into a different role to help your team win the game. Right. And mm -hmm. that goes into the boardroom with him. 
That's not right. character. Not the touchdown. Yeah. The touchdown is great. Like we celebrate it in the moment, but but it's a reminder that not every eleven year old boy has the wherewithal to be able to step back and go. We need to do what's best for the team at this moment. So right. I, I like to remind the athletes I work with that they're the skills that made them successful at sports are directly and immediately transferable into other areas of life. Yeah. Yeah. But the place where they can try it on and it's less scary is sometimes through philanthropy or through charitable work because it's a really silly example, but follow me, you guys. So um, love my sister. My sister does not love going to work out. It's not like a thing for her. <laughs> right. So years ago, she was trying to get herself into more of a fitness routine and she said, I hate walking. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And I, I had one of those like early old school Fitbits and um, we went to the mall and we walked around the mall for a couple hours and stopped. And I said, Hey, guess what? You just walked six miles. And right. She's like, wait, what? You walked <laughs> six miles. How? Well, we were walking, we were talking, we were shopping. We were just having a good time as sisters at the mall. And now we've leaned into like the practice for, and after that, she was able to like kind of rejigger it and say, well, I guess walking is walking. It doesn't have to be in a gym or on a treadmill. Right. Walking is walking. Right. Same right. thing with athletes. I say to them, we're going to go to this children's hospital we're doing this event. Can you say a few words to the kids, you know, about how much it means to be here? They would say to me, I'm afraid of public speaking. I'm a terrible public speaker. I feel uncomfortable getting up in front of crowds and talking. They do mm -hmm. that. Then they do the same thing to them. So you saw what you did there, that, that whole like microphone amplification, people sitting in front of you thing, that's, that's public speaking and you right. killed it. So guess what? You actually have the skills, but because it was done in a philanthropic space, they mm. don't feel as intimidated by it. Now, if I took that same individual and they said, we're going before the UN or we're going into a board meeting and I want mm. you to talk about this, it could be the same exact topic but they're going to feel less comfortable because they see it as the expectations are so overwhelming that they're unable to see their own strengths through their perceived weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so by taking them into this place where the kids are just smiling and happy to see them, they're like, I got this. Right. Yeah. I got this. Yeah. I can do yeah. this. Yeah. So it's totally a bridge sort of to at least just practice flexing that muscle of mm -hmm. perceiving exactly those weaknesses. And right. it's also, I think really crucial and Chinny can attest to this to like, uh, build that relationship early on with athletes more specifically, but anybody who's like a master in a singular thing, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it depicts or at least leads to them creating their own identity around that sole thing. Mm -hmm. And once that thing is over, athletes is a great example, because like you said, they get devalued the older they get. There's a serious level of anxiety and fear of like, well, after basketball is over, like, who am I? What am I supposed to do? Yeah. Sort of. And it's also that if you've been the best at something, like right. not just, not just really good, but like the best, like many of my clients are introduced as like, he's one of the greatest linebackers of all time. She's the most decorated Paralympic athlete of all time. Like those are some big things to be carrying on your shoulders. And so what I hear often is, I don't hear them saying it per se, but I know it. I can sense it. It's people expect me to be the best at everything because I was the best everything at one thing. Yes. And mm -hmm. I don't think I can ever be the best at that anything other than that one thing that, that I was thing. really good right. at. Right. Mm. Um, yeah. That you know, I mean, sense. think about even if you go back to whoever, you know, whatever your family relationship was like growing up, if you had siblings, if you had parents, if you had step parents, whatever, like each one of us is given an identity as a child. And there's something you know, some kids want to leave, live up to that or exceed expectations. Others give up really easily. Um, athletes as a whole are always looking to exceed expectations to beat whatever that next goal is. They're as competitive right. with themselves as they are with anything. Mm -hmm. And there's something overwhelming about stepping into something new from the start <laughs> starting line. And you're like, all right, it was a really long journey to get to be the best at that thing. And I can't be average. I need to be above average. Right. And right, right, so, right. so how do you do that? Um, and when you're empowered around that, that's right. where things like peace players comes in is yeah. because you're giving people a place where they can showcase to themselves how strong they can be. Right. But you're also showcasing it to all the people sitting around you that, that they have that within them too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very, very, I mean, you know, 
thank you ladies and gentlemen that's it um the show was, <laughs> yeah like i there was one point i looked over at emmett and he's just like me listening to the story like just you know <laughs> just like all in it like you know but I pass out popcorn. It's all good. I know. <laughs> seriously. I, I was like, I was like reaching down to get a drink of water. And then I was just like, yeah, I don't need it. I don't need it. I'm listening right now. I'm just so enthralled. No, um, Joanne, okay, just no, quickly. Yeah. Were you, were you, sorry, I, I'm just curious your story as well. And sort of, were, did you, what, I, I read that you were a competitive figure skater and sort of just I like, was. What, can you yeah. give us a little bit more info in, in that journey as well yeah it's just who you are too yeah 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 I'm, I'm going to give you a little more than i normally would i think because of where we are in our conversation at this point but i, I was actually i was in a really bad car accident when i was five years old mm -hmm. and i lost most of the use of my right arm wow. and i was told all these things i couldn't do but if you go backwards when i was one two three years old like rumor has it that one of my first words outside of mama and dad i was self i want to do things myself and so mm -hmm. now i'm being told i have to ask for help for all these things. And I, I had, it frustrated me. Like I can remember being frustrated. I remember somebody bringing, this tells you how old I am, Star Wars Lego set into my hospital room and, and being annoyed because you know how hard it is to unclick Legos once they're clicked. If you oh don't my have gosh. full use of yeah. your right arm. Gotta use your teeth. Gotta use your yes. teeth. Yep. Yeah. Gotta you use your teeth. And, and oh, and my jaw was wired shut. So that was not oh. going to happen. Oh my so God. I'm sitting there and like, but, but think about that, right? So here I am, this little five-year-old girl, and I'm, I'm frustrated by the fact that I can't even unclick Legos by myself. And I love Legos. Legos are amazing. Every kid should have Legos in their life. <laughs> so um, this portion brought to you by Legos. No, um, but, <laughs> but, but, but so, so when I was about seven, I went to a birthday party for a friend at White Flint Mall in Washington, D.C. area. That's Washington. And, mm -hmm, yeah. See, get on the red line. You'll get off Thank at you. White Flint stop. Absolutely. Um, there, is a, there was a rink there. And I'm, I'm, I'm on the ice and I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Like I'm, I'm athletically oriented and I get home and I actually wrote this whole thing out for my parents telling them why figure skating or ice skating was the sport that would be okay for me. Cause there were no flying objects that could hit my face. There was, I didn't hang from anything. It favored, I'm not a tall person. I never have been. It favored girls who were more petite, you know, all these things. So my parents basically said, all right, you can sign up for, you know, the snowflake classes. Well, I was pretty determined. So very quickly I moved beyond the snowflake class and soon enough, you know, private lessons, but, but skating, skating was so amazing because it enabled me to go out and do things that people told me I couldn't do and to try it. Yeah. But I also had many stumbling blocks along the way. I, yeah. when I was in my early teenage years, I had like, I developed a massive fear of one particular jump because I broke my wrist double black. So I broke my wrist doing it. And, um, but I was able, I was 12 years old. I was able to say, um, I need everybody to stop hovering over me. I'm going to go. I went to the rink at like seven in the morning when nobody else was there. I told my mom she had to leave. And I just got out there and I was like, I got this, like, I'm going to visualize this. And then you just do it. Right. But, but I learned my own strength through sports and, yeah. and then sports ends. You know, my sport was one yeah, where by 16, sport. 17, you know, most yeah. of us are injured out. You've maybe, maybe you had a growth spurt and became like five, three and three quarters like me. And so now you're like tall. It's crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm figure skating. Um, but but it, it changes, I mean, it changes your center of balance and everything. But it's funny because I've accomplished a lot since then. But if you were to ask my mom to describe me, what was most interesting about me or most unique? She might say, well, you know, Joanne was a competitive figure skater, but I'm 30 years past my competitive figure skating right. career. And yet right. it's still part of how I define myself. Mm -hmm. So when I'm working with athletes, I feel like I have that sense of awareness because I know that part of me. And I know that it's something that I identify so strongly with. I also know that it enabled me and empowered me to become who I am today. Right. Right. But, um, but skating, you are judged not just objectively, but subjectively. Right. Mm -hmm. And you get extra points because there's a judge who has a, daughter, a granddaughter with red curly hair and he thinks that mm -hmm. that's amazing that you do too. And so right, I, right. If I saw Judge Ernie was on the panel. Ernie was going to give me extra points. And yes, his name really was Ernie. <laughs> it's not a made up name. Because um, right. <laughs> you have to be named Ernie as a skating judge. Um, but I loved, I loved skating. I still love the sport, but I also see so many places where sport is 
is broken or where we're putting expectations on particular young people that don't enable them to grow up into who they're meant to be, but makes them feel like they need to marginalize who they are. And, and right. for me, one of those tipping points was a dear, dear friend of mine who I grew up skating with. Um, and he took his own life when we were young teenagers because he was gay and he didn't feel like he fit in in the mm -hmm. world that we were in. And so that's another example of a time and a place where I said, like, I have to, he's not here anymore. I, I, I need to be there to represent his voice in some way. And I may not be LGBT, but that doesn't mean that I, I loved him deeply and I wanted right. him to live a okay. full life. Right. Um, and just probably three years ago, I was at the World Figure Skating Championships. I, was, I brought my daughter with me and we went to this reception after you know, the meet and greet thing or whatever. And the pairs, one of the pair skaters was wearing a, a amazing pride shirt that he had worn during the exhibition. They were the gold medalists. It was huge. It was amazing. And I walked up to him and I, I said my friend's name out loud to him. And I said, you know, had you been on the world scene then, maybe he's still here. Right. And, right. you know, this poor guy, he's like, starts crying or whatever. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, let's hug. And then let's talk about what you're going to do with this. Right. And I, you know, and, and we work together on this now. It's like, what are we going to do to elevate this platform so you have a platform, what are you gonna do with it? Right. And I had a call just the other day with the great Billy Bean, who's the head of diversity equity um, for Major League Baseball. He was the first out baseball player. And, and he, while we were on this call, he turns around and he grabs this stack of letters. It's like this tall, it's like six inches tall. And he says, um, so he was closeted for so many years and then he, through a series of events and go to athletesvoices.org and you can see that uh, his story, but he grabbed the stack of letters and he said, this is my homework this weekend because I, I feel like if I don't open every letter that I get each month, that there's some letter in there where I may have been able to save somebody's life. Like, life. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And you just, I'm like, yeah, cause you're Billy Bean and you can do that. Right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just Joanne Pasternak and I think I'm pretty cool and worth yeah. listening to, but I'm not, I'm not Michelle Kwan who's standing up for women's rights and looking right. at pay equity. And I'm not right. Phaedra Knight. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not these women who are empowered to men and everyone out there who's empowered to be able to do it. So what are they going to do with it? And that's what Athletes Voices is all about. That's what my work is about. It's, right. it's saying um, you've got a voice, now just go do something with it. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. amazing. And I just want to make a comment really quickly, Jenny, before yeah. you dive into the, this yeah, question, because yeah, yeah. the that inner resilience that I think is clearly evident in like what you've just described, specifically, I, I'm still fixated on the 12 year old you being yeah. petrified of this one move that mm -hmm. when you did uh, broke your wrist, like I think that your parents it sounds like were so uh willing to let you do this it wasn't like a forced thing that you were like forced to do you did it all on your own accord this inner voice that you had to be like like you said you just went out on the ice at 7 a.m by yourself and you're like no i'm gonna do it kind of right. thing that 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 little thing and it's, it's such a horrible use of the word little because it's not but that <laughs> um that drive aspect <laughs> yeah that drive Mm -hmm. Is that something that you feel as though you can teach to people and sort of grow and nurture? Or is that something that like you were like, this is just like part of who I was and I just had this inner voice. And it, to be that young and so in touch with your inner voice is really, because I think everyone has that inner voice, mm -hmm. but it's just creating and nurturing that dynamic to be able to connect yeah. with it and be able to do it. Does my that best, question make sense? My, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. It does. Yeah. My, my yeah. best guinea pigs are unfortunately for them, my kids. Um, I have a daughter, <laughs> Right. I have a daughter right. who just turned 14 two weeks ago, a son who will be 12 in November. And, um, and I've worked with so many kids over the years, but here's the thing, like kids believe what we tell them is possible for them. I mm. wholeheartedly believe that. It's true. And, it's true. When we tell somebody that it's impossible or we put barriers up and we don't give them a chance to actually find their own strength, then 
they start to believe that they're incapable. And I, right. I said this to my husband when our, when our kids were first, they were itty bitty. And I said, I want to raise kids who one day I would want to hire. So that was one. The other thing I said is I want our kids at a certain age, like if I were to drop them off in a city that they'd never been to before with 20 bucks and no cell phone, could they make their way home? I wouldn't actually try this. I'm not, right, right, right. I'm not about to no, get no, it. Yeah, try it. No, but it was, you know, please. philosophically, like, could right. they do that? And, and it's funny because I was, I was back home in Washington, D.C. earlier this week. And my 11-year-old, who is super independent and super self-confident, he wanted to get, you know, go explore and go. We were staying by DuPont Circle. He wanted to go out and get a snack and go on his own. And I fully believe that he is capable of this because I've seen him in action. And by standing back and allowing him to do things within safety, I mean, obviously yeah. we take safety precautions, but... But what I've heard from friends who work with, like one of my dear friends, Ali Knight and, and Krista Gannon, they, they have this organization called Fresh Lifelines for Youth. They work with kids who have been incarcerated to help them get their lives back on track. Oh, nice. And what's Very different nice. about this organization and has flipped the rate of recidivism from 80% of kids returning to protective services, juvenile detention, or jail um, to in their program the young people who complete their program, only 20% go back, is that wow. they tell them what they're capable of. So it is about, you made, yeah, there are mistakes. We all make mistakes. It's what we do after we've made the mistake that matters. What are you going to do to build yourself up? And we believe in you because we see all these really positive things in you and we know what you're capable of. And so like, I, I mean, to say that I'm committed to looking at what post-incarceration life looks like for people and how we lift them up versus push them down. Like mm. that's probably one of the, the biggest things for me. I, you mentioned in the, the beginning that I'm on the board of Special Olympics, been involved yeah. with Special Olympics, worked at their headquarters right out of yes. law school. And, um, and there's a woman I worked with there, Loretta Claiborne. She's phenomenal. If you haven't seen the movie about her life, um, mm. go find it. It was produced by Disney many, many years ago. But mm. Loretta was literally left on a doorstep um, when she was born in Philadelphia and, um, and, and not much was expected of her. And this is a woman who's now the chief inspiration officer for Special Olympics. She has spoken before Congress. She has run, I don't even know how many marathons. And um, Loretta and I were together at this amazing gathering in Rome, Italy at the Vatican a few years ago called Sports at the Service of Humanity. And I was actually standing yes. next to Loretta and <laughs> That's you know, cool. you know, yeah, it's the title. Um, Loretta, <laughs> Loretta very directly spoke about why. What she was the one she was presenting a Special Olympics soccer ball to the Pope, and had no hesitation nor qualms about it because she knows that her voice is one that should be heard and that her story is unique. It's because people, even though at the beginning she was told what she couldn't do, there were people still there beside her saying, "You are capable." Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, one of my heroes in life is Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who founded Special Olympics, and her son, Tim Shriver. And um, that's how they look at the world. And that was one of my earliest professional jobs was working at Special Olympics headquarters and being in their presence and watching them say things like Mrs. Shriver would say, let's see if we can't find a way to make that happen. Like to me, as a 25-year-old recent graduate school graduate, like no business speaking up. But she didn't discount it because she actually empowered me to believe that it was possible, but not with false sense of like, this isn't saying to your kids, you're perfect, you're awesome, you're wonderful, you deserve a gold right, medal. Like right, 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 It's right. saying to them, like, let's figure out what, what it is that you bring to the table. And I see that in you. Like, I just had this conversation with my 11-year-old the other day. Like, you have superpowers and we're going to yeah. lean into those. Yeah. But you're not good at everything and that's okay. You're not supposed to be good at everything. Right. But you're, right. if you can be the best at this one thing, like, so that's how I look at it, Emmett. It really comes down to just like, like you said, just a belief in the, the kid himself and also that kid feeling as though there's a support system around him. And then like, that's pretty much it for the most part. Like the kids will well, do don't most have to of be good lifting. at everything. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's, it's telling our kids, you don't have to be great at everything. But Frank Gore, who, you know, I'll introduce him as one of the greatest to have ever played the game, period. Um, future Hall of Famer, amazing person. Um, 
I did this event with Frank probably 10 years ago where we went to a school um, where they had a really amazing program for kids who had learning differences, dysgraphia, dyslexia, whatever it might be, audio, audible processing challenges. And Frank said something to them, which I'll never forget, which was, he said that, you know, when he would score a touchdown, he would point up to the sky. And he said, why, you know, why I do that? He would always pound his chest and then point. I just made a really awkward sound with my microphone. So now you can all hear that, but that was me pounding my chest. Um, But it was, he said, it's, it's because I believe that I have to have the heart and I have to be grateful for the powers above, but it's also that every single one of you has something that makes you want to do a touchdown dance and something that you do better than everybody else. Like everybody does. It could be, you could say the alphabet backwards really fast. Like it doesn't matter. I can't do that by the way, but no, it, yeah. Yeah, it's tough. But, but just <laughs> figuring that out and telling your kid that that's something we're celebrating. Um, so yeah, that yeah. was a much longer answer than you had hoped for. I'm sure. But no, that's no, no, it's great. A great question. It's, great. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Da, 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 lightning round. Yeah. Sound effects cued. <laughs> um, yeah. Jenny, do you want to explain the lightning round or do you want to leave? Yeah, so uh, welcome to the lightning round. Um, Thank you. It is I've made it just, this far and now I just made it you this have, far. You have. I made it this far. Uh, it's, it's super fun, uh, light and easy. You, you'll uh, Emmett will ask you a series of questions. You'll have about uh, three to four seconds to answer those questions and just enjoy yourself. Um, that's mm-hmm. all it is. That's really it is, uh, what it is. So a- a- Emmett? Go yeah, it's got to be quick and don't worry on your answers. We'll judge you heavily on each one. <laughs> please do, please do. Um, okay, would you rather score a game winner at home or away? At home. Okay. What was the last thing that made you smile? It's, that's tough. <laughs> I smile all the time. Um, right, right. You can tell us. It's fine. It was you guys. No, yeah. I, and it was la- it's, honestly, it was laughing at myself at my ineptitude today with trying to find a place to plug in and the fact that I'm sitting on the floor. So that made me smile. Welcome to the podcast. I am sitting on the floor, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Coffee or tea? tea? Morning bird or I night owl? Both. Right. Now you got to choose one. These are fast. These are I fast. don't, but I don't. Night, I guess night owl. I don't sleep much. Okay. Cats or dogs? Dog. Ooh, spring or autumn shout, shout out nah, shout out to wesley the bernie doodle because okay shout out wesley the bernie doodle we yeah. see yes. you we appreciate yes. you he feels it yeah spring or autumn spring is my birthday i love spring mm, mm. bungee jumping or zip lining i love zip lining Ooh. um superhero oh no that's too easy never mind next singing or dancing dancing Ooh. reading or writing Ooh. Ooh. Um, one person who inspires you coach kerr steve kerr oh shouts yes. out steve kerr mm-hmm. you know steve if you ever want to come on the podcast we'd really we are appreciate open it. to that you know we're, open to that. we're super busy but we'll keep a slot open for you if you're listening to this i mean um, he's an authentic he's an authentic leader i just yeah. i love him He's, He's amazing. I just got his uh, biography, the like, new one that just came out. Um, okay, last one. One thing you want the listeners to remember from today? That they have the power to make a difference. Start mm. with our billboard. Let's go mm-hmm. back to our billboard. Mm. Um, find a way to make a difference. Oh. Mm. And with that, yeah. the lightning round is over. We'll reconvene and give you your score in a later date. I appreciate that. I think, that. I think, you, did, I think you did pretty yeah. well. I was reading your eyebrows, trying to not be judged heavily, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. Well, we don't have that much more time, but I do want to talk a bit about, um, we had another uh, guest on the show for season one uh, who did similar work, well, actually exactly the same, you know, just uh, with different audiences and, and who is currently one of the directors of the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation Sports Award oh, yeah. and the co-founder, yeah. Alicia Greenberg, uh, and the co-founder. I, I, I know Alicia, I teach in her program, Sports Entertainment Industry Certificate Program. Yeah. Alicia and I are dear, dear friends. She's wonderful. Mm, shouts out, Alicia. Right, right. Um, and and so, when I was with the 49ers, we won the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Award. So. Oh, very cool. Very, very cool. cool. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and she she taught us mm-hmm. a lot. 
uh, just like you. Uh, and she spoke to us about what it's like to grant awards to nonprofits um, that are working to better their communities and the people they serve, uh, mm -hmm. and what it means to hold those nonprofits accountable to make sure that they're actually doing the work for the people. And I think from, I'm interested to know from your perspective uh, in working with athletes and various franchises and sports organizations, um, how are you, like you yourself, Joanne, ensuring the that philanthropic uh, philanthropy is authentic and supports the needs of the community through the work you do? How do you how do you ensure that? Well, I, I try not to be presumptive. You know, it's it's so easy to step in and tell people what you think they need or what you think they should do. Um, it's listen you have to look to those in the community i was i was in baltimore the other day one of my clients tori smith love tori tori has built up and built out a community center in the heart of baltimore city um and tori is somebody i really admire because what he did before he broke ground on this project before he even put one coat of paint on the building was he went on monday nights walked with the men of the community who do this thing. It's just, they just walk and talk. I mean, you can picture it. It's a bunch of old guys walking around talking and Tori shows up and he's like, Hey, can I walk with y'all? And, and they're like, uh, you know, you're Tori Smith, right? He's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. But I'm just going to walk with you. And the reason he did that was because he wanted to listen and learn. And so that's what I think is most important in terms of authenticity and knowing what your community needs and listening to the needs of the community. I also, and I think all three of us can probably relate to this in some way, but I take issue with people expecting me to be able to speak up and speak out about something because it's part of my identity. So just because I heavily identify and was raised Jewish, great. That doesn't mean that I'm the authority on all things Jewish. I'm the authority on all things that relate to red curly haired, left-handed Jewish girls who grew up partially in Montgomery County, Maryland and partially right, in California right, right. and on and on and on. And so if we look at people for who they are and how they self-identify, we're going to be far better off than if we try to pigeonhole them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's way too much of that going on. So mm -hmm. I mean, I've um, talked a ton today, but it's really trying to listen and ask okay. a lot. I ask a ton of questions. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm interested to know this story and we'll get to Katie because I, I heard you like uh, in a different um uh, interview talk about his uh, his philanthropic efforts and oh, yeah. how it's amazing to work with athletes who um, just outright have a cause and they're driven by that cause and they want to help the community so we'll talk about that but I, I'm interested to know in another interview and you talked about the the perfect formula for uh, uh, social uh, responsible or corporate responsibility for these, mm -hmm. these huge teams um, yeah. and I know that you're passionate about uh, women's and and girls um, a parody uh, and just advocating for them. And so mm -hmm. taking that formula that you talked about, taking that formula of what makes social responsibility with these yeah. corporate, uh, uh, this perfect, um, this perfect equation for that, this perfect formula. It, do you think that there's a perfect formula that exists um, that we can begin to utilize to ensure that when we're talking about sports uh, philanthropy, we have women and girls empowerment at the forefront of our minds, as well as uh, ensuring that uh, that that gender parity is is prevalent or is evident or is in or exists in the mm -hmm. sports industry. Like, do you think there's just a perfect formula for that? So, one of my clients, I love, love, love them. I love all my clients. I guess that's probably what comes out. But um, Odessa Jenkins is the CEO of the Women's National Football Conference. The WNFC is the elite women's tackle football program. They are phenomenal. They. I, I've learned a lot from Odessa. I've, I've learned so much from conversations with her. I kind of just want to hang out with her and soak in all of her magical insights all the time. But um, I brought one of my other clients to the Women's National Football Championship in Dallas in August, um, Patrick Willis, who's one of the greatest linebackers of all time. And Patrick is huge hearted, amazing human. And he says to Odessa, like, man, this, these women, these are legit football players. Like they could, they could knock me down. And Odessa looks at him and she says, but, but Patrick, that's not our goal. Our goal isn't to knock the men down. Our goal is to be recognized for what we're exceptionally good at. And she says, right. she's like, I'm a hall of famer. 
and I'm the best mm-hmm. at what I do. And I know mm-hmm. this and I want to be respected for it. She's like, but if you put us man to man, not going to work. Like Odessa mm-hmm. is not a gigantic woman. She's, she's pretty small, but, but man, I wouldn't, you know, I want to recognize her for what she's best at instead of trying to make her compete with the guys in order to prove that she's as good as them. Right. And so, so that's really what it comes down to. It's like, let me be the, the best at what I'm meant to be versus trying to make me into something and where maybe I don't fit in. But the problem right. is, is and I, I heard this a lot growing up, you know, get a seat at the table, then your voice can be heard. And then you get to the seat at the table and you look around and you're like, all right, I'm here, but, but people typically only wanted me to speak on the topic that I was brought in to be the expert on. So that's you know, social responsibility, philanthropy. But I look at it as like, if we're not thinking about it from a ticketing and operations, a game day um, exposure, what are the themes for the game days? Why, how are we gonna market all that together? And ultimately we need to win games and generate revenue and social responsibility needs to be inculcated into that entire philosophy. So if I'm looking at it from the sports philanthropy, social responsibility, and then the corporate side of it, outside of sports even, it's, it goes back to this ikigai symbol. It's what are you best at? What does the world need? What can bring in funds? And what do you love? And so I lo- that's why I love that the Home Depot Foundation leans into bringing shop class back. I love that... Um, I, I mean, I could name so many different organizations, but the ones where they actually say, this is what I do and this is what I do best. Um, and, and we're unique, like Dick's Sporting Goods. Like my, my brother's a high school teacher. He uh, launched an athletic program at a very low income school in Las Vegas. And, but for Dick's Sporting Goods, partnering up with Donors Choose and providing the fulfillment for a campaign he had online, he wouldn't have a baseball program for his kids. Mm. Um, mm. but Dix knows that they have that. And so they're mm-hmm. doing it authentically in the right way. Dix is not coming in and saying, we're going to solve childhood cancer. It's an right. important cause. It's a, it's a crucial cause, but knowing what you're most suited to address is a way that you can ensure that you're going to have that legacy impact that you hope to have. Yeah. Right. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think uh, what's so great about everything you said today and what's so great about everything you're sharing with us is that uh, you made it clear that it doesn't matter what level you're on, right? You work with the most prominent and the largest and greatest mm-hmm. athletes of all time. Uh, and then you talk about a bit about yourself and you talk about your son, right? And you talk, talk about, you bring it back to the grassroots level and that everybody can, can make a difference um, at whatever level they're at. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I think I'm most interested in, in, in hearing and knowing is what is something that you would impart with our, our youth who want to be a Joanne? You said, I'm just <laughs> Joanne, but just, yeah. I would take mm, out just in front yeah. of your name. And I, w- I would say there, I'm sure there are plenty of young people who want to make an impact, want to make a difference um, using their sports platform. What would you say that they could do? What are, how about this? We'll go five, five things, yeah. five qualities, yeah. that they, five things that they can do to really be true uh, sports uh, philanthropists and, and use their platform and their, their position in sports to help mm-hmm. their community, help change the world, help sure. their, themselves. Their, their best friends or themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. My, my really good friend, McCall Hall, who is an assistant athletic director at the University of Southern California, USC, she works with all the athletic teams, the undergraduate athletic teams, and she helps them to lean into what they do best. And so if you have the women's fencing team and you have a men's football team, obviously they're on different levels in terms of their visibility and and the funds that they bring into the university, right? But Mm -hmm. how do you empower both sets? And I would Mm -hmm. say the five things, um, it's, uh, it's being authentic to who you are and recognizing what you have to bring to the table it isn't trying to knock others down, but it's just trying to be the best at what you're, what you're doing. Um, women in particular, we just, we just need to start being friendly to each other and, and giving hands up to others. I mean, Patrick Willis says this all the time. He always goes, you know, he, his, his vantage point, he wants to lift others as he rises. Like he's very, right. 
focused on some of the biblical teachings. And, and so it's, it's remembering my dad would always say this, like when you, when you leave any room, act as though you w- might come back at any moment and you want to be welcome. So don't leave on a bad note. Like even if you're as pissed off as one could be and feel like you've been wronged, like it's just hold your head high and say, um, you know, I appreciate the opportunity and don't burn bridges. But the hardest part about that is that you also have to stand up for what you believe in. And, you know, as another dear friend and client, you know, Colin Kaepernick says, it's like, you got to stand for something. I mean, you do. Um, yeah, or you stand for nothing. And what are you willing to sacrifice mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in order to stand up for what you believe in? But I just said all that and I said it in a really that was way too wordy and way too complex, but I would just say that overall, <laughs> it's just, right. It's just figure out, like, be true to yourself, be vulnerable, allow yourself to fail right. and, um, and celebrate your wins and celebrate the wins of those around you. That five. So that's, really... that's the top five, top five. Okay. That? Yeah. Top five, top five. Love that. Yeah, no. Top five. Yeah, that's like drop moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, you know, the great author, um, Elie Wiesel, uh, a Holocaust survivor and Nobel Prize winner. But um, there's a there's a poem that's that's written in the Holocaust Museum where my my great aunt Joyce is my aunt Joyce is a docent. And it and Elie Wiesel would reference this. And it was, you know, this poem origination is not known, but it says first they came for. You know, and then they name a group and then they came for this next group. Mm-hmm. I didn't speak up because it wasn't me. And then, you know, and it goes on and on. And then it says, and then they came for me and there was nobody left to speak up for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we've all heard some version of that before, but I think about that all the time. I'm like, just because somebody isn't speaking up for me doesn't mean that, like, I have an opportunity. I'm going to do it. So, so when I say, like, particularly with women, let's be there for each other. Let's lift each other up. Let's celebrate each other's wins. And it's, it isn't just one seat at the table. There's many seats as we pull around it. So there's so many different tables too. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. That's when, I, when I hear that, I'm like, which table? Cause there's which they, table. Yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you, can I, do I, do I, that was a drop the mic moment there. And I, I want to know, I, I, that's the last <laughs> thing. I want to know yeah. what your next three to five years looks like, like what you're doing, how, how that impacts others. Uh, are there barriers so, um, that, gonna, that you run into yeah. what that look like? Who are you serving? You know, it's, it's interesting. I've, I mean, it's been, it's been a, it's been a rough year in some ways. I mean, for everybody, the pandemic, all of that, I've learned a lot about myself. Um, I am more committed than ever to the Athletes Voices program. We are launching our second season of our speaker series. We're going to be addressing really interesting topics. We're doing our first convening of athletes who are newer to using their voices around social impact, social justice in March of 2022. And I, if I could spend all my time building that up, building it out and, um, providing those pathways for athletes to connect with other athletes outside of their normal channels. So if I can connect the wheelchair basketball player with the NFL star, with the figure skater, and they all find that they want to lift their voices around a topic that's of interest to them and together they can do more, like I'll feel very fulfilled. So, you know, the next three to five years, I'm going to be building my business Awesome. building athletes voices, finding people yeah. who want to join us, support us, sponsor. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be there. My daughter is a, the current U15 national champion in USA modern pentathlon. And she's in eighth grade and I'm trying to like keep up with her. And my son oh my is, she's, she's on fire, you know, but, but I want to be able to live what I say. Mm-hmm. And so I say to her all the time and I say to my son, like, I just want to figure out what it is that makes you, you, and let's make that the thing that you get to focus on. But I, it, it's really bizarre to me that my kids are at the age now where they are humans who 
know who they are, but who are still mm-hmm. so vulnerable. Right, and yeah. my goodness, middle school is no joke. Um, Love that. So yeah. we're going to survive that together too. <laughs> Love that. Find what makes you you and be kind to, to others as you, yes. as you navigate that, that path. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. With, with that, I think. Well, I mean, Joanne, do you have, yeah. do you have plugs so that people That's can it. follow yeah. up to date on what you're doing? And also <laughs> sure. where, where can we hear these? Are these athlete voices uh, speaking engagements? Because I'm very curious, and I know Chinny is as well. So, athletes voices, that's plural, athletes voices oh, dot yeah. org um, is our website. You can go there and you can actually click on the links and see all of the episodes from season one from 2020, 2021. We launch season two. I don't know when this will air, but we launch October 15th. So, um, we'll have them. Thursdays, one a month, you can go in and, and watch those. Uh, and we have nine scheduled for this upcoming season as well. Um, so athletesvoices.org. Check out Oliver Rose LLC if you want to learn more about yeah. Ikigai, if you want to learn more about um, the name Oliver Rose and how that came to fruition. Mm. Um, and uh, my mom, my sister, my grandpa are all librarians. I have a I have Joanne's overdue book club there because I realized there were a lot of books that athletes I work with were overdue to have read. So go check that out and find some books that can inspire you um, and, and help you to figure out who you are. And um, you know, just like, like Gamut just said so beautifully, like just be kind to each other and let's keep lifting each other up and not, not assuming that we know what people are going through but at least a friend of mine said to me, so he, he lost his dad about three months after I lost mine. And, and he said that the thing that meant the most to him was when people said, at first it annoyed him when people would say, I know what you're going through. And then he reframed it in his mind. And he said, what they're really trying to say is I know you and I know what you're going through and I'm here for you. And Mm -hmm, so if we can think about that in the context of just life in general, I think we're all going to be, a little bit more of a kumbaya kind of yeah. society and yeah. now feel pretty good. So yeah. that's where we're yeah. at. That's, that's my Thank story. So and I, I really yeah. appreciate you guys bringing me in today. We definitely have to have another conversation soon. For sure. Yeah. You guys are fun to talk to. And um, I think you caught me, you caught me in some vulnerable moments here, but I, uh, I, I, you know what, that's part of it. I think as long as we can put it out there that we all have vulnerabilities and we get to be help each other out so yeah. you guys are awesome thank you for having thank me you. on thank go you so peace much. players really appreciate you yes. And, uh, yes i'm here to help anytime you need it yes thank you so much Joanne. take care right. and that's it for today's episode thank you all for listening and joining us on this amazing journey like i always say if you like what you heard we encourage you to like and subscribe we've got so many more brilliant and amazing conversations and stories to share in the coming weeks share with a friend or leave a review like uh e Apia02. Great podcast. Love the content they cover. Mm. I mean, mm. we love the content we cover too. Yeah. Um, Emmett, anything? Do you have anything you want to say? No, that was short and sweet, that uh review. So, you know, can't say it better myself, really. We do, we do con- <laughs> we do cover great content. Right, right. Um, thank you, Chinny. Uh, Thanks. you can learn more about what we just talked about and everything else that we do as an organization by following peace players at www.peaceplayers.org or by following us on social media mostly at peace players international on instagram facebook twitter linkedin and even youtube as well and don't forget tumblr and myspace no i'm just <laughs> right, kidding right, right. that was the asmr version of tumblr right. and myspace we don't have those nobody does um and don't forget to leave a review uh rate our podcast on apple Podcasts. it helps us a lot we read every single review we get we it, it we brings us great joy in these times of sorrow no i'm just kidding it, it does bring us great joy though it does bring us great joy right. um and uh yeah jenny she was sitting on the floor today i'm gonna go lie down on the floor <laughs>